All right, so we can write an electron configuration for anything on the periodic table just by following along uh, the boxes, essentially, left to right, top to bottom. Uh, for example, if we wanted to write the electron configuration for selenium, we would find it in the periodic table. It's right here. And then we will start at the beginning and go 1s2. That gets us from hydrogen to helium. We're essentially putting an electron in each box. Now we're ready to start on the second row, so 2s2. That gets us through lithium and beryllium. Then boron through neon would be 2p6. Notice that we are in the second row, and that is exactly how this row is numbered, and that is our quantum number. Then we're ready for 3, so 3s2, 3p6. That gets us all the way through argon. Then we're ready for 4s2. Slightly out of order based on the, the, the levels because the D's come after the 4S, so this is 3D. We go all the way through the 3D, so 3D10. And then to get to selenium, one, two, three, four boxes into the 4P section, fourth row, P section, 4P4. So selenium's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p4. As you can see, these can get quite long, and so we have a shortcut notation, a shorthand notation to draw a, uh, an electron configuration. Uh, to, to employ the shortcut notation, you find the element and then work your way backwards to the nearest noble gas. Remember that our noble gases are here, group 8A. And so selenium, we could think of as starting at argon. So we would put argon in brackets. And that stands for argon's electron configuration. And then we would begin writing an electron configuration from argon. Again, we're in the fourth row, so we're at 4s2. We've got the 3ds to go through, 3d10, and then 4p4. Essentially, argon is this. There is argon's electron configuration, and so I would just write everything um, after argon's electron configuration. And that's uh, sometimes referred to as the, the noble gas shortcut because we use the nearest noble gas. I would not start back at neon. Um, I always start with the nearest noble gas to use the shorthand notation. Um, we can also draw an orbital diagram with this. Essentially, an orbital diagram um, is a visual representation of what's going on with the electrons. Recall that the electrons have a spin associated with them, a spin up or a spin down. And so I would draw a picture that would represent the orbitals and the electrons in the orbital. Now, usually we don't worry about drawing the inner electrons we would only draw what we call the valence shell orbital diagram. The valence shell is the outer shell, the outside shell. And for selenium, it's the electrons in n equals 4. Since it also has some 3d electrons, we'll draw them as well. Essentially, you start drawing from the nearest noble gas. So for selenium, the orbital diagram would look like a 4s orbital. And I can either draw a line or a circle or a box to represent the 4s orbital. And then I would represent the 3d orbitals, leave a little space. The 3d orbitals is a set of five, and so I would draw five lines. Probably want to put them more in a straight line, but mine are a little sagodalin, but it works. So these are the 3ds. And then the 4ps, remember that the p orbitals are a set of three, so draw three lines to represent the 4ps. And then on these lines, draw arrows in the up direction and down direction to represent the two directions of spin for electrons. And so the 4s electrons, there are two of them. One spins up and one spins down. Remember, that stands for clockwise and counterclockwise, but we just say up and down. So my half arrow pointing up is one of my electrons. My half arrow pointing down is the other. When it comes to filling in the 3d orbitals, I'm going to put 10 electrons in there. Two electrons will fit per orbital. One spins up and one spins down. So let me just go ahead and draw those in. I have 10 orbitals, uh, I'm sorry, 10 electrons, five orbitals, two electrons per orbital. 
And now I'll put in the 4p electrons. Remember that the 4p is a set of three. I have three lines representing it. And there are only four electrons to fill in to these three orbitals. Now there are a couple of different ways to fill them in depending on um, how I arrange the electrons. They have to be up and down, but I could put, um, for example, I could put four electrons like this, or I could put four electrons or I could, there are other possibilities, let me just give you one more. I could put the electrons so that they're in different orbitals like this last arrangement, but let's say I spin some of them up and spin some of them down. Um, which one of these is the correct orbital diagram? We want to represent exactly what the electrons are doing in the atom, and so what we do is we look to experiment. Remember that the uh, spin of the electron causes a magnetic field. The spinning electron uh, induces a magnetic field. That's how we could tell that they were spinning. If I have an electron spinning up and down in the same orbital, their spins cancel, which essentially means their magnetic fields cancel. So I would expect if I saw a configuration like this, then my substance would not be magnetic. If something is not magnetic, we say that it is diamagnetic. Um, diamagnetic substances are either not magnetic or actually sometimes they're even slightly uh, repelled by a magnet. But that's what we would expect if all of our spins were paired. If, in the case of this, notice that I do have two electrons with spins paired, but these last two electrons are spinning in the same directions. Their, spin is, their spins are not paired, and so this would generate a magnetic field. So this scenario would indeed give us something that was magnetic. If I look at the last scenario, I have these two spinning in opposite directions and their spins are canceled, and I have these two spinning in opposite directions, so their spins are canceled. So this last scenario would also be not magnetic. If we look to experiment and we actually test what selenium is, and we have to do so usually with a very, very, very uh, powerful magnet, one that can measure very small magnetic fields, we indeed find that it would be magnetic. And so we say then it ha the electrons have to be filling in in this fashion. A substance that is magnetic is called paramagnetic, and a paramagnetic substance um, is magnetic because a paramagnetic substance has electrons that are not paired up. Uh, unpaired electrons generate a magnetic field which causes the species to be magnetic. And so selenium is paramagnetic, therefore we can deduce that the electrons are filling into the orbitals in this fashion. And in fact we see that with all substances um, that have electrons that fill into these orbitals um, in a subshell where they're all the same energy level. Um, if the orbitals are all the same energy level, like these three orbitals, we say that those are degenerate energy, uh, degenerate orbitals. Degenerate orbitals mean they have the same energy. And given the option, as electrons fill into degenerate orbitals, they will fill into the orbitals unpaired and spinning in the same direction until they have to start pairing up because they've, they've run out of empty orbitals. Uh, we call this Hund's rule. Um, there was a man named Hund, and Hund was studying um, electron configurations, and well, he was studying the way that electrons fill into orbitals. He was studying the way that electrons fill into orbitals, and he was looking at substances' magnetic characteristics, whether they were paramagnetic or diamagnetic, and he discovered this general rule of how electrons fill into these degenerate orbitals, degenerate energy levels, um, and notice that they would always fill in spinning in the same direction until they had to pair up. So if I've got any generic P subshell, the electrons will fill into the first orbital spinning in one direction, doesn't matter if I draw up or down. A second one would fill into a second orbital, a third one would fill into a third orbital, and then if I have a fourth electron, then they have to start pairing back up. If I have a fifth electron, they have to pair back up as well. If I have a sixth, it would finally finish filling up that orbital. Now, as I have unpaired electrons, 
unpaired electrons mean that that substance, that, that particular atomic substance would be paramagnetic. If I end up with all of my orbitals, um, all of my electrons completely paired in the orbitals, then that is a diamagnetic substance. So an orbital diagram represents the orbitals as they're filled into um, um, on the atom, as the electrons fill into them. It represents them either with lines. We could also represent, for example, we could represent a 4s orbital with a box or a circle and stick some electrons in there. We could represent the 3d orbitals. It's a set of five. We could represent them as boxes. And again, fill electrons in. And if I fill electrons into the 3d subshell, I will fill them in individually, spinning in the same direction until I have to start pairing them up again. A lot of times I'll fill them in this way to begin with. So that would represent a 3D subshell with 10 electrons in it. And this is the way we draw an orbital diagram. Usually we do start from the nearest noble gas. We don't go all the way back to 1S unless it's only got electrons in 1S. And um, we, call, we refer to this as the valence shell for drawing these orbital diagrams. All right, I want to show you one last thing concerning the electron configurations, and that would be exceptions to what we've just been talking about. All right, there are a couple of elements that end up being an exception to Aufbau, that idea of building up um, on the periodic table, and they are very predictable, and you simply have to memorize them. The first one occurs with chromium. If we were writing the electron configuration of chromium using the principles we've just been talking about, we would start with argon for our shortcut notation, our nearest noble gas, and then we would write 4s2, 3d, count it up, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right. However, uh, when we take chromium into the laboratory and we study the magnetic characteristics of it and look at um, experiments that will tell us where the electrons are and which orbitals they're in, we do not see the electrons in these orbitals. What we see instead is we see electrons like this. Essentially how we can think of it is chromium has taken one of its 4s electrons and promoted it into the 3d subshell. So chromium's electron configuration is argon, 4s1, 3d5. Now there are reasons for this. There's some um, energetic stability that it gains by half filling this 4s subshell. The 3d subshell is not half filled or completely filled, but it is half filled here. So there's some stability gained by half filling or completely filling a subshell. And so chromium chooses to do this, and we simply memorize it. So chromium's electron configuration is an exception to Aufbau, and you must learn it. So is molybdenum. Molybdenum is also an exception to Aufbau. If I'm drawing the electron configuration for molybdenum, I would begin at krypton for my shortcut notation, and then notice I'm on 5s2, 4d4, except for that's not what it looks like. It is krypton. 5s1, 4d5. Again, it undergoes the same type of promotion. So chromium and molybdenum, exceptions to Aufbau. Um, the last exception to Aufbau that you need to memorize, that you need to learn, is with copper. Copper's electron configuration, if I were drawing it according to Aufbau, would be argon, nearest noble gas, 4s2, 3d9. Indeed, if we look at it in the laboratory, this is not what we see. We see argon, 4s1, 3d10. Again, we see a similar promotion of an electron, and so copper is an exception to Aufbau. So is silver, and so is gold. So silver and gold will also do very similar things with promoting one of their s electrons up into the d subshell. So those are exceptions that must be memorized.